All right, so now that you guys know all about DNA primary structure, we're going to jump into secondary structure, and this is where a little bit of history comes in. And so um, secondary structure really refers to the three-dimensional configuration or the helical structure of DNA. And this was um, actually, uh, everybody credits Watson and Crick with this discovery, but actually one of the... Um, scientists that didn't get awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery um, was uh, Rosalind Franklin and uh, it was because she actually died very sad um, before the Nobel Prize had been awarded so you can't earn the Nobel Prize posthumously unfortunately so alright so um, secondary structure and the helical structure was really um, discovered because Watson and Crick did a big literature review. And so they, he actually um, spent a lot of, or they actually spent a lot of time reviewing research that had previously been done. And they came up with this kind of 3D structure that they had built based on the literature. But what really pushed everybody over the edge to discover this double helix structure was um, some of the um, X-ray um, diffraction methodology that uh, Rosalind Franklin did. So she was able to um, get way better structures in her lab using that technology. And so that really started to show the double helix structure. So um, the double helix is going to be an anti-parallel configuration. So again, like we talked about in single or in the primary structure, anti-parallel means that, that we have two DNA strands that are actually hydrogen bonded together by the nucleotides. Those are the red bonds in the center. And those strands of DNA are oriented in an anti-parallel or opposite direction. So keep in mind, anti-parallel refers to the five prime end um, and the three prime end. So a three prime end will always be across from a five prime end, and a five prime end will always be across from a three prime end. All right, so the hydrogen bonds in the center are actually pretty weak bonds. Um, they're easily broken, which is going to be a good thing because we're going to need to break up the double helix structure when we get to DNA replication and um, protein synthesis. But you can, we can see here that we've got different amounts of bonding taking place. But regardless of the total number of bonds that it takes, A is always going to bond to T, so adenine to thymine, and guanine is always going to bond to cytosine. The biggest difference here is that the bonds between A and T um, they only need two hydrogen bonds, and the bonds that occur between G and C are threefold. So ask yourself this question, which one is actually going to be harder to break and take more energy to break? All right, so hopefully you thought about that, and it's actually the bonds for G to C. That extra hydrogen bond takes a little bit more energy to um, uh, unstabilize those two structures. So but keep in mind, when DNA is uh, stranded together in a double helix form, G is always going to bond to C, and A is always going to bond to T. All right, so when the double helix actually starts to um, roll up onto itself and form the actual helix, or it looks like one of those spiral staircases, um, it creates this stacking action. And what ends up happening is the adjacent bases are going to be aligned so that the rings are parallel and stack on top of one another. Okay, so here's our backbone of our DNA, DNA right here. And the purple across here, that's going to be the hydrogen bond that's happening between our nucleotides. So we get this stacking action, and it actually creates two different types of grooves, a minor groove and a major groove. Okay, so the, the hydrogen bond is going to be um, holding the two 
strands together. And then our phosphorus bond is actually playing more than a role of linking nucleotides together. Remember, the phosphorus bonds are negatively charged at three oxygens. So when it stacks up on one another, it actually will help stabilize itself um, and stabilize those bonds. So that's why DNA is so stable in its helical form is because of those phosphorus bonds or those phosphorus charges. All right, so we can get a couple of different secondary structures to form. Um, a and B form are very similar. Okay, so A, a is going to be, um, uh, is where we're going to see like kind of shorter, squattier um, uh, forms actually take place. And um, so that's what we call A DNA. And it is, we're going to see this configuration when we have less water and it's going to be in a right handed fashion, it tends to be shorter. And because it's shorter, it tends to be wider across here. So B DNA or the B form of DNA is, this is the structure that Watson and Crick and uh, Rosalind Franklin actually discovered. Okay, so it's, the B DNA is actually going to exist when water surrounds the entire molecule and um, there's not going to be any like majorly weird base sequence issues. So, and I'll explain the base sequence thing here in just a little bit. Okay, so again, this is going to be a right-handed form. So the A form DNA and B form DNA are both going to be right-handed helixes. The th um, third secondary structure, that sounded weird, but the third form of secondary structure that we see in DNA is called Z form. And this is completely different than the other two. So first of all, you probably already noticed our arrows are going in different directions. So A and B are right-handed turns. Z is actually a left-handed turn. Okay, so, and it's not only just a left-handed turn, but what ends up happening is the uh, major grooves and the minor grooves actually almost being end up being the same width apart. So it's really kind of long, um, stretched out DNA at this point. And this can occur when we get weird base pairing going on. So when you get like a sequence of DNA that, you know, has one nucleotide or one sequence of nucleotides for very long ways. And when that happens, um, it can actually cause this um, double helix to be left-handed in configuration instead of right-handed in, in configuration. The interesting part about the Z form DNA is that it has actually been associated with gene expression control. So there's some cancers that um, actually can um, can be caused because or uh, can be a result of Z form DNA. Um, so that's it's just kind of an interesting conundrum. I can actually share a a peer review journal article with you guys if you would like so just let me know all right so Watson and Crick's structure really um, and Rosalind Franklin's let's not forget her they really gave us um, the ability to detect the, this DNA thing the DNA structure and really gave rise to the field of molecular genetics which is the section of the class that we are working through now so with the molecular genetics field, we actually have the ability to look at the actual gene now rather than just assume what, uh, what the gene is based on the phenotype. 